First is neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. Um, what you'll see on majority of these slides are going to be these little links for Picmonix. Um, so Picmonix has actually updated their website and actually have these cartoon scenarios, stories, and questions um, related to trying to remember assessment or treatment of different disorders. Um, most of these are pediatric related, so they are directly related. And then other ones like respiratory failure is respiratory failure, regardless of infant or adult. Um, so you'll see these uh, hyperlinked in these slides. So you can do those on your own time. They are um, to help supplement your understanding and application of these um, disorders. So neonatal respiratory distress syndrome is related to uh, developmental delay in lung maturation and surfactant deficiency, which leads to an unequal inflation of alveoli on inspiration, which collapses the alveoli on the end of expiration. So then you end up with symptoms of not being able to open your airway, your lungs. So tachypnea, dyspnea, pronounced intercostal or subcostal retractions, fine inspiratory crackles, audible, audible expiratory grunting, flaring of external nares. You have some cyanosis or pallor, especially as this progresses. Um, you, then apneic episodes and deterioration of vital signs, of course. So your blood pressure, your um, body temperature and stability, all those things as the body slowly starts to fail um, due to not enough oxygenation. Uh, so treatment for this is going to be exogenous surfactant because that's the issue, right, is the surfactant not being able to keep those alveoli open. So then we're going to treat it with um, surfactant. So we're going to administer that through an endotracheal tube. Um, this promotes the open airway through um, opening the surfactant so that it sticks to the lining so that it stays open upon expiration. We're also going to try and open up the airway as much as possible. So in infants, neonates, um, the position that is best for opening airway is going to be a sideline position with their head supported on a small folded blanket. So this kind of extends that neck, opens the airway, um, but in that sideline position. Okay, so pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is when air leaks into the space between the lungs and the chest wall, so that thin lining. Uh, so this can be caused by lung disease, medical procedures, or chest injury. Uh, so what we'll see in the client is going to be shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, and hypoxia, especially as this pneumothorax increases in size. You can see in this picture that once the pneumothorax increases in size that of course obstructs the lung from inflating completely and the more of the lung that is unable to reinflate after expiration the more likely we're going to be in a hypoxic state um, so we're going to need to decompress that pneumothorax uh, through needle aspiration so we insert a needle and let that air deflate like a balloon or insert a chest tube um, so that it can be continued to be sucked out and make sure that reinflation of that lung does occur and does not get trapped. Uh, so it can, this is going to improve respiratory effort and hopefully see signs of hypoxia reversing. That would be the goal. Bronchopulmonary dysplasia is when the infant's lungs become irritated and don't develop normally, resulting in fewer but larger alveoli with thickened walls. So that thickened wall then makes it more difficult for the infant um, to breathe, to cross the oxygen from uh, into the bloodstream from the alveoli, right? So despite effort of the infant trying to breathe compensating increased respiratory effort, it's going to be difficult just due to the anatomy uh, to transfer that oxygen to the blood. So this is going to be commonly uh, seen in low weight infants born two or three 
two or more months prematurely. So premature infants are going to more likely have this uh, anatomical condition. Persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborn. So this is when the infant doesn't get enough oxygen after birth. And when we look into the reason of it, um, so pulmonary hypertension, the blood is backing up. So this is essentially when the blood skips over its own lungs. Therefore, the blood is not being oxygenated. And then when it is perfused to the extremities, to the brain, to the heart, it is not going to meet the needs of the infant. Um, so this can occur due to uh, meconium aspiration during in utero or at the time of birth due to infection, respiratory distress syndrome, or a lack of oxygen in, in utero. Um, can also occur for diaphragmic hernia, of course, due to the pressure that is being exerted there, making it difficult for the blood to be oxygenated. So, of course, symptoms are then are going to be of hypoxia, so rapid or shallow, slow breathing, grunting, retractions, a blue discoloration of the skin, cool extremities, and low blood pressure throughout the body. Remember, this is pulmonary hypertension, so if the blood pressure is high in the pulmonary arteries, in the extremities, it's going to be low. Opposite, right? Um, and then, of course, we're going to have low blood oxygen levels due to not being able to cross that oxygen into the bloodstream. Meconium aspiration syndrome is going to be when meconium amniotic fluid is being aspirated by the newborn. So we're going to see this as trouble breathing in the newborn. Uh, meconium is, of course, the dark green sterile fecal matter that is essentially the first stool of the newborn, and it can occur before or during the time of birth. Uh, symptoms are going to include a blue discoloration of the skin. Of course, remember, this is essentially just um, a warm body obstruction as well as potential for uh infection that is occurring in the lung so you have the inflammatory response um, and everything that's going on so we're going to end up with obstruction mucus all this cascade of things right so then again hypoxia and so what you'll see throughout this whole respiratory thing is something that is occurring that is causing the inability to oxygenate either anatomically or as a, an effect of. So blue discoloration of the skin, breathing problems. Meconium stained amniotic fluid, of course, is going to be the key here. Um, limpness of the infant is one of the first signs after birth um, that this may be an issue. Um, we're going to treat it with antibiotics, of course, to prevent um, that uh, infection from worsening and causing the respiratory distress from worsening. Um, we're gonna apply the baby to a warmer to maintain their body temperature because of the irregularities that they may have. Um, and then chest physiotherapy to loosen the secretions in the lungs. We'll talk about that a little bit more in uh, cystic fibrosis later about what that entails and what that means. Um, so we're just trying to loosen those thick secretions and get those expelled through out of the lungs. Apnea of prematurity. Uh, this is the cessation of breathing by a premature infant that lasts for more than 20 seconds and or is accompanied by hypoxia or bradycardia. Uh, this can be related to infection, hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage, um, seizures, increased intracranial uh, pre pressure, congestive heart failure, shunting of the blood, pneumonia, hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, acidosis, anemia, um, necrotizing enterocolitis, um, gastroesophageal reflux, hypothermia, hyperthermia, prenatal exposure to drugs, or postnatal postnatal exposure to sedatives, hypnotics, and narcotics, like after a procedure. So there's many different reasons, and so we're going to determine 
what is the reason essentially so that's the first step determining if it's a central apnea or an obstructive apnea so is there something that's causing what is the cause of the apnea so then we're going to treat it by the cause if it is um an obstruction then of course the procedure would be to remove the obstruction of however we can if it's due to central apnea then um medications that we can use and interventions are going to be of course the uh cpap and intermittent mandatory ventilation that can also help with the obstruction trying to force that air in right but if it's central apnea Caffeine and theophylline are mexilanthines that we can administer to the newborn. Uh, this can be through peripheral IV. Eventually, we might need to move it to a um, central line, but um, these are kind of stimulants to help um, stimulate the infant and prevent that apnea from occurring. So, caffeine is actually an IV drug for newborns. Um, I don't think I've ever seen caffeine in any other area besides in NICU. So, um, but this is an IV drug. This is not, you know, oral caffeine, you're giving them soda. Um, this is an IV drip, caffeine. Okay, so acute viral, viral nasopharyngitis is the common cold. It's just the fancy medical term for uh, acute viral nasopharyngitis. Uh, so this is re upper respiratory infection is the other terminology that's used. Um, so this is very common, very frequent in children less than three. Anyone who is around children, have had young children, know they get the common cold very frequently. So symptoms can last up to 14 days, two weeks. <laughs> it can seem like a very long time. Um, so we're going to treat this with um, I mean, it's a virus, so unless it becomes a bacterial infection due to the inflama inflammation, you can only really treat it by symptomatic treatments, right? So we're going to treat their discomfort, their fever with antipyretics, so that's acetaminophen and ibuprofen. Uh, we're going to monitor for complications. Uh, so look at this box, box 40.4. Um, page 1132. So this is going to go over some complications of when uh, acute viral nasopharyngitis, the common cold, actually becomes a concern, um, which is not very common. All right, so next is acute infectious pharyngitis. So this is group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infection, so strep throat. So this is of the upper airway um, and can lead to rheumatic fever once it, if it um, progresses down to the lower airway, can cross over and cause quite damaging effects to cardiac. And so um, in the rheumatic fever portion that was discussed previously, of course, you know, you have a lot of concerns with the rheumatic fever. So this, this is where one of the potentials that it has uh, started from uh, could have been from a strep throat infection, acute infectious pharyngitis. So um, it can lead, like I said, to rheumatic fever, but also glomerulonephritis. Remember in the previous lecture also for genital urinary, um, a recent infection can be a common cause for glomerulonephritis. So strep throat in and of itself is okay, but it should be treated fairly early, caught early so that it does not progress to lower um, and then systemic. So as long as it stays upper, we're okay. So this is going to be noted by inflamed tonsils and pharynx, which may be covered with exudate, as you can see in um, these pictures. Uh, we have um, the infectious state of the infection is going to be up to 24 hours after antibiotic therapy has started. And so they should not return to school until the antibiotics has been in their system for 24 hours or more. Um, we're going to educate about, you know, trying to prevent the spread of infection by re 
placing their toothbrush after the 24 hours of antibiotics to prevent re-exposure of the strep from their toothbrush to now the antibiotic treated um, child. So we want to change out those things so that everything is nice and clean or boil it if um, they aren't able to replace it due to income, um, but they need education on replacing all of those oral hygiene uh, things after antibiotics have been started. So once we start antibiotics, if the child continues to have a high fever that does not respond to antipyretics, um, has an extremely sore throat, refuses liquids, or appears toxic, then they should um, get further evaluation by their physician, which means um, we want to make sure that it does not pro progress to the complication of becoming rheumatic fever and so so tonsillitis can also occur with pharyngitis it can progress to it or be um, present at the same time uh, so it, tonsillitis can be viral or bacterial um, tonsillitis is just the inflammation of the tonsils right if it becomes recurrent tonsillitis um, then we might consider tonsillectomy and or ad adenoidectomy. So recurrent throat infections have, have occurred or it's interfering with um, sleeping so that you have sleep disordered breathing. So when we are in need of surgery for the tonsillectomy and or adenoidectomy, um, we are going to, as nurses, need to um, provide close monitoring of their airway. They already had a very inflamed, uh, potentially obstructing airway. That is why we decided to do the surgery because we're having obstructive sleep disordered breathing. Um, so then you have surgery, you have cutting, you have inflammation, you have bleeding. Um, so we're going to need to monitor this very closely. This can be quite an emergency situation after a tonsillectomy. So close monitoring of airway and breathing and for bleeding and hemorrhage is going to be your key factors here as the nurse. So, and then we're going to, of course, need to alleviate discomfort with antipyretic or analgesic drugs. Um, but our first concern, airway, breathing, circulation, right? Um, and then we can manage pain and discomfort. Hemorrhage can actually occur up to 14 days after surgery. So this is not just in the immediate post-op. This is education that needs to be provided to the family members um, to monitor for. And so symptoms are going to be of tachycardia, so increased heart rate if the child becomes um, pale, has frequent clearing of their throat or swallowing. So they start noticing that their child is just swallowing a lot, just seems to always have to stop in the middle of their sentence or after a few words and swallow again. What are they swallowing? Probably blood. So it, it may not be noticeable or um, clearly evident of, you know, hemorrhagic bleeding, but if something is constantly oozing, over time that is going to be considered a hemorrhage because it is not stopped bleeding and you've lost too much blood so frequent swallowing or clearing of the throat is one of those hallmark signs that we need to be aware of okay another hallmark sign is going to be vomiting of bright red blood of course due to the frequent swallowing of the blood sits on their stomach stomach does not like the blood and therefore the GI system tries to get rid of the blood by vomiting. Um, so then the bright red being that this is brand new blood, um, not already digested, old clotted blood. So where did the brand new blood come from? The tonsils. Um, another hallmark sign is going to be restlessness. Uh, so if the child infant is very restless, uh, irritable, uh, that can be a sign of hemorrhage as well due to the irritation to the stomach, to the irritation of the throat, um, that their only true sign is restlessness until we find that bleeding. 
Um, so it may be pushed off as the general discomfort after the surgery. And so then not noticed that they have been bleeding over time. And then the late sign once it's noticed is that there's a decrease in blood pressure and then you have shock. So frequent monitoring watching for signs of hemorrhage and promoting um, and intervening for airway. Those are your key goals as nursing interventions. The flu, influenza. So influenza, of course, we've discussed before. Um, in children, it's going to be quite similar. Sore throat, dry cough, rhinitis, so runny nose, uh, fever, chills and headache. Um, so Ostomolivir can be used for children that are one year and older within two days of the onset of symptoms. Zemolivir is also within two days of symptoms but can only be used for children that are seven years and older so they need a little bit more maturity of their organs to filter that um, antiviral. So Ostomolivir is usually the most common one because it is more versatile. It can be used um, for younger children, uh, uh, starting at one year and older. Um, Xanamivir can also be used as a prophylactic for children that are five years and older. So say there's a sibling that is tested positive for flu. Um, of course, they're in the same household, maybe even they share the same bedroom. And so then to prevent that five, six-year-old child from getting the flu, um, we can prophylactically prescribe Zamomavir to that um, toddler, school-age child, I guess, technically school-age child, um, Zanamavir to prevent them from acquiring the flu from their sibling. Um, prevention of the spread is going to be obviously one of the key interventions for the nurse um, regarding education to prevent it from spreading through the household um, as much as possible. But of course, this is a um, respiratory illness, so it's usually going to spread pretty easily. Um, one of the key factors um, for preventing the spread is prophylactically. Um, so prevent from acquiring it or at least lessening the uh, severity uh, if you acquire the other version. So there's A, B, and sometimes C versions of influenza virus that goes around each um, season. So the flu vaccine, the influenza vaccine, is usually the one that is projected to be the most uh, increase in cases, most likely to be spread during that season, and so that's the one that they vaccinate against. But that does not mean that the other versions of the influenza virus are not prevalent, So, but they are very similar in um, gen their genetic code, and so vaccination against one, uh, even if it's influenza A, and then you acquire influenza B, you have some markers against the influenza virus to help um, your immune system attack influenza B. Therefore, even though you weren't vaccinated against the flu, you did acquire the flu after a flu shot. It is a different type of flu, um, but your severity of the flu is not going to be as severe as if you did not obtain the flu vaccine. They've seen this through clinical trials, evidence-based practice, and so the best way to not only prevent you from getting the flu, but also decreasing the severity of the flu if you were to acquire uh, influenza is to receive an influenza vaccine, which of course would be seasonally, so every year receiving an influenza vaccine. Otitis media. So this is an ear infection of the middle ear. So you'll see presence of fluid in the middle ear with signs of illness. So this is very common in young children. It usually follows an upper respiratory infection, so like a common cold. Um, so then this fluid builds up 
in the sinuses, builds up and gets trapped behind the tympanic membrane. So again, this is the middle ear. Um, this is not an external ear infection, which is usually like swimmer's ear. Um, so there's a difference in here. So make sure you understand the difference in otitis media and ex otitis externa. Um, so symptoms of otitis media, inner ear infection, middle ear, infection is going to be ear pain, of course. Fever may or may not be present. Sometimes um, there is no fever. Um, there may be purulent green-blue discharge um, or may not. You may just get this hazy appearance that's behind the tympanic membrane and no discharge coming out of the ear because, again, this is an inner ear infection, um, middle ear infection. So you may not see any external signs because there's no infection of the external ear. Um, so the child may become, may exhibit fussiness or irritability. Um, so what we're really looking for hallmark signs in this case is then going to be rubbing or holding of the affected ear, pulling of the affected ear, um, so that they're just paying more attention to this ear for some reason. But the ear itself is not going to be red irritated, swollen, because that again would be external ear infection, right? So all of your symptoms are going to be middle ear because it's a middle ear infection. So you don't really get any external signs until it's either ruptured the tympanic membrane or progressed to also an external ear infection. Um, so other symptoms of otitis media are going to also be, you know, difficulty in comforting the child, loss of appetite, and then a popping sensation when swallowing because of that change in pressure, really. Because there's already so much pressure built up in that area due to the fluid. So we're going to treat this with antibiotics for children that are two years old um, or younger due to uh, persistent acute symptoms of fever and severe ear pain. So in a lot of cases, this should resolve on its own. But if this is persistently occurring or fever is reoccurring and it's just not going away, then we might progress to antibiotic treatment. Um, so in that case, it will be usually amoxicillin in high doses for about 10 days. Um, if the parents are non-compliant, they have concerns with insurance and this is an ER visit or what have you, we may actually um, give them a one-time IM dose of ceftrioxone and then that way they don't have to worry about picking up a prescription, everything on one bill, or they're non-compliant. So we want to make sure that this gets treated. Um, so those are indications for doing the IM. Of course, we always want to do the least invasive as possible. So the first line of treatment would be the and the PO version, and then the IM only in these cases. If this continues to be persistent, um, continues to be a problem, continues to have to need treatment, um, we may need to consider a meroangiotomy or tympanostomy. So this is um, placing air tubes or um, uh, surgery to the ear to prevent this from reoccurring and reoccurring and reoccurring. Um, we can also provide education to the family about trying to prevent this from reoccurring. So what um, could be happening is uh, feeding the infant in a lying down position. Um, so lying down, swallowing, you have um, aspiration risk. You also have um, all of your sinuses in the same area of where you're swallowing, right? So if you reflux anything, if you aspirate anything, your sinus cavities are going to have an inflammatory reaction to that foreign substance, the milk, the acid, whatever it is, and cause this to progress up, right? So that is used one of the most common things. So education to the family, um, about preventing this from occurring by holding the child upright for feeding. So kind of the same stuff that you would do for like reflex. Um, avoid propping the bottles up so that it prevents them from having to extend their head um, so that they're not having to 
um, promote that pressure, which the pressure would then push any kind of aspiration or issues into the sinus cavities. Of course, maintaining their immunization so that um, they're less likely to have uh, severe respiratory infections um, or other types of infections because, again, this occurs usually after um, an upper respiratory illness. And then uh, breastfeeding until at least six months of age, which we know gives that colostrum, at least in the initially, but then up to the six months uh, can um, promote those antibodies. Uh, getting to the infant and promoting their immune system as well. So complications of a otitis media is that the tympanic membrane ruptures. So the pressure builds up, the fluid builds up, and the membrane has to let go, and therefore everything is relieved. So then this hallmark sign is going to be a sudden relief of pain because the pressure is relieved, right? So they're pulling, they're tugging, they're irritated, they have some pain, irritation, and then all of a sudden they're fine. That could be the sign that the tympanic membrane has ruptured. Um, and then of course, all of that fluid and exudate would be start running out. Um, so that would be uh, another sign, but not the first sign. The first sign would be that sudden relief of pain. Um, so that is of course a complication we need to um, treat this as soon as possible so that um, there is not uh, an issue with hearing in the future. We need that tympanic membrane to hear, you know, that's our eardrum. Okay, infectious mononucleosis. So this is mono, or commonly known as the kissing disease. This is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, which is transmitted through saliva. So sharing drinks, water fountain disease, kissing disease, things like that. Uh, so common in ages 15 to 24 year olds old. Um, also can be uh, contact, contracted through mucus and tears. Um, so make sure people aren't sharing items. It's, it's gross. Um, Symptoms are going to be fatigue, fever, rash, swollen glands. That's going to be your kind of different symptom here. Most of these are going to be fatigue, not feeling great. You may or may not have fever, uh, but this rash and the swollen glands are going to be more of the hallmark and make you want to start looking at mono. Um, so we're going to treat this, of course, as with most viruses, symptomatic relief, right? So rest fluids, over-the-counter pain or fever reducers, um, symptomatic relief. It's all we really can do. Um, in the meantime, we want to make sure that we're monitoring for those liver enzymes, uh, watching for liver damage, because mono can actually become a systemic problem, um, not just a respiratory secretion problem. Um, so in the meantime, while they, these children are contagious, they do need to stay away from other children, make sure that they aren't sharing toys, um, water bottles, drinks, not sharing spoons, knives, um, you know, uh, toddlers, child, uh, school age children, they like to share um, this is when they're starting to develop friendships and things like that. So this can spread very easily among that age group. And then again, you'll see it um, rise again in the high schooler stages um, for through kissing and uh, sharing of water bottles at a water fountain and things like that. Um, so those are the, kind of the two most common ages. Acute epiglottis. So this is a medical emergency. So this image on the left is the normal opening of your esophagus, your airway, right? So you have an opening there you can breathe through. However, in the case of the one on the right, which is acute epiglottis, this is severe inflammation, which then closes off the airway. And as you can see in this image, they had to intubate in order to preserve this airway. 
So this is an abrupt onset that can rapidly progress to severe respiratory stress. So this child may go to bed with no symptoms and then all of a sudden wake up with a sore throat and pain with swallowing. Um, and then that may not be addressed by the parent. Um, just, you know, oh, they woke up, they have a cold, they're having a little respiratory illness. Um, but then it's going to continue to rapidly progress and you have respiratory distress symptoms. They come to the hospital. You see this on the right side. You need to intubate. So um, going to bed without symptoms, waking up suddenly, sore throat, pain with swallowing. That's kind of uh, the first kind of situation that you hear from from these parents when they're telling you what happened once they, they report to the emergency room. So this can be with a fever, um, usually without, um, with or without, I mean, um, appears sick with very little findings other than a fever and a sore throat. Um, trends of the client, you know, sitting upright, leaning forward, kind of that tripod position, trying to breathe, right? So their airway is slowly closing off. So their body is trying to compensate in this tripod position, trying to breathe. The hallmark sign here is drooling. So that sudden inflammation, inflammatory response that's occurring, we all know causes that mucus in the mouth is gonna cause saliva. So there's drooling, they're having difficulty swallowing already. Where is that saliva gonna go? Outside of their mouth, so they're drooling. So drooling is the hallmark sign here um, that you know, cold respiratory symptoms. Oh, they just have a sore throat. Um, they have an upper respiratory infection. They just woke up in the middle of the night. It's probably just a come cold. But if they're drooling, that is a red flag. So as the airway is closing, dyspnea and then becoming this barking cough, this is when it's too late. Um, the airway is closing. You're having difficulty breathing. Barking cough may occur. Um, immediate intervention is to preserve the airway. So preparing for an endotracheal intubation is the first thing that the nurse needs to do. Recognize the symptoms, noticing the drooling, preparing for endotracheal intubation. So once this has been flagged, you have a red flag in your brain, you're not going to use a tongue depressor. This is actually contraindicated at this point. Do not assess the throat. You see the you see the drooling. You see the symptoms. You don't go any further. Um, only trained practitioners should assess the airway, and only when intubation equipment and everything is already set up and ready. So that's why you need to as only assess your symptoms, not the airway first. Key there. Okay. Once everything gets set up. Then the practitioner assesses the airway because then any kind of gag reflex, any kind of minor trauma with this tongue depressor might be too much inflammation, no more airway. So having everything ready so that as soon as the airway is assessed, then you preserve the airway. Um, IV access um, with IV infusion is gonna be indicated, of course, just with like anyone that's being intubated. Humidified oxygen via um, a, a mask or blow by on nasal cannula for younger children. If this has not progressed to the point of requiring intubation as severe in this picture on side B, um, if this is noted early on, maybe promoting oxygen, um, monitoring very closely that swelling, they may not need to be intubated, but everything needs to be ready and available because this can rapidly deteriorate um, due to the rapid um, swelling. So the swelling usually decreases on its own after about 24 hours, um, not on its own, but after about 24 hours of antibiotic therapy, usually this is treated with ceftrioxone. So once this has been noted, you see the drooling, um, we're going to promote um, airway, interventions, trying to keep that airway open. Um, we're going to, of course, not intubate if we don't have to, but there's going to be that tricky balance, but everything needs to be available. So in the instant that it is indicated, everything is ready to go. Um, and then initiate septrioxone therapy.
and usually that swelling will decrease. They can be extubated um, or no longer need that oxygen to hyperoxygenate what little bit of the airway is open to get into the lungs um, to kind of push that air in, um, oxygen in, right? So um, this is going to be very key, very um, not common, but one of the few medical respiratory emergencies in pediatric children that you have to be on alert for. It has to be in your repertoire as a pediatric nurse. Okay, so next is acute laryngotracheal bronchitis. So this is croup. So common name, croup. So this is that barking seal, seal bark kind of cough. Um, so croup. Um, this is inflammation of the larynx and the trachea um, associated with subglottic um, edema and often in children ages three months to three years. Um, this is going to have occasionally, in most cases, fever. Um, you have your um, inflamed larynx, so a change in their voice might be seen. Um, we're going to treat this with humidified air and cool mist and then, of course, steroids because of its inflammation. We're going to try and decrease that inflammation with steroids. So then our goal for treatment is going to decrease the respiratory effort um, occurring by the child and decrease the symptoms of stridor, which is going to occur due to the closing the inflammation of the airway as the air is being stressed to be exhaled. That's when you get your stridor, right? Um, so the inflam inflammatory obstruction of the airway is what's causing the strider, and so then we're treating with steroids, humidified air, cool mist, to try and decrease all of that inflammation and that irritation. If um, strider retractions or difficulty breathing becomes persistent or progresses to this point, we um, are going to progress to nebulized epinephrine. Um, so this is going to cause vasoconstriction and decrease the subglottic edema. Um, so then our, again, our goal is to improve the airway obstruction. So absence of strider, absence of retractions. We want the absence of what caused us to do this in the first place. We're going to um, have close monitoring of their oxygen saturation. So they're going to be on frequent pulse ox monitor, if not continuous, um, and then a frequent respiratory assessment. So we're going to continue to go in that room. We're going to continue to listen to their lung sounds. We're going to continue to um, listen to auditory lung sound, so strider, um, that cough, their croupy barking cough, their, their voice changes, things like that, anything that could indicate, again, that narrowing of the airway. Acute spasmodic laryngitis, so this is spasmodic croup, so proximal attacks of laryngeal obstruction, so this happens spontaneously. Um, this is usually croup that only or more frequently occurs at night, but they feel fine during the day, during the next day. Um, so we're going to treat this the same as infectious croup, but of course we're going to be more on high alert during the nighttime than the daytime because that's when this is occurring. So same as croup. Um, Bacterial tracheitis. This is the infection of the mucosa and soft tissues of the upper trachea. Um, so we're going to see symptoms of both croup and epiglottitis. So with features of both croup and epiglottitis, we're going to have to, of course, still have that close monitoring so that we make sure that we don't progress to respiratory emergencies, right? Um, what's going to be... Um, more notable here is going to be an elevation of the white blood cells because this is due to a bacteria in the, instead of a virus. Um, but it's going to affect the same kind of uh, areas of the respiratory tract. So you have similar symptoms of croup and epiglottitis, but your difference is going to be that white blood cells. Uh, so for these, you're going to treat with immediate oxygen therapy, 
we're of course antipyretics, so any fever, we're going to treat with antipyretics and then antibiotics because this is a bacterial infection. We're going to observe very closely for respiratory failure and intervene as necessary. And then endotracheal intubation may be needed if severe obstruction is um, occurring. So just like with the severe obstruction with epiglottitis, epiglottis, I keep wanting to say titus, epiglottis. Um, so it's the same thing. This is going to have similar features. So if it gets to that severe portion uh, as epiglottis does, then endotracheal intubation may be necessary. So think of both croup and epiglottis in the same um, situation um, and then add bacteria to it and then you have this bacterial tracheitis. So it's going to be treated very similarly to the other ones um, with the addition of antibiotics. Um, early recognition is going to then of course be key just like with epiglottis. Bronchitis is the inflammation of the large airways, so the upper airways. So this is going to include the trachea and the bronchi. Uh, this is going to be associated with upper respiratory infection, so then um, symptomatic treatment. So we're going to symptomatically treat the upper respiratory infection um, and the inflammation that is uh, occurring in the upper airways. Bronchiolitis is the inflammation and swelling of the smaller airways, so the bronchioles. This is when um, it can be a little more detrimental. Um, closer monitoring. Once it progresses to this lower airway, it's going to be um, key to watch for any complication. So symptoms are going to call, start as the common, like common cold, but as it progresses, so do the symptoms. So then it's going to start with like sneezing and coughing, nasal congestion, common cold, intermittent fever, right? But then as it progresses, that inflammation of the lower airways, any inflammation of the lower airways, you know, those are smaller vessels. So a little bit of inflammation, it's blocked off, right? So then we're going to have apneic episodes, symptoms of hypoxia. Um, this is going to be common amongst infants between 2 and 12 months of age. Um, severe cases may need to be treated in the hospital, but most cases will be able to be treated at home um, with symptomatic treatment and prevention of the spread due to whatever virus that is causing this. Um, so just monitoring for those complications, and if it is severe, may need to be in the hospital. Respiratory synctival, synctial virus, so RSV. This is very contagious and common um, in children. This is a virus that causes respiratory tract infections in which the infected cells of the mucosa fuse together to form a synctium, uh, which is then the purpose of the name. So a synctium is a cell that has multiple nuclei. So the cell wall membranes are fused, but of course they still have their nucleus. Um, so multiple nuclei, but one cell. Um, so they all formed and squished together. Symptoms are going to be similar to the common cold that progresses. So as the symptoms progress, of course, then we have worsening respiratory distress symptoms, right? So again, starting with the running nose, decrease in appetite, coughing, sneezing, fever, progressing to wheezing. Um, spread is through contact with infected items. So contact precautions is going to be what is required in these children at this time. Um, so it should be included in the plan of care or education to the family if they are caring for this at home. Dedicated equipment then, of course, is going to be required due to contact precautions. So they're going to need their own um, bottle sign machine, stethoscope, thermometer. Um, all of the equipment needs to be in the room. Dedicated equipment, don't leave the room um, for that patient because it will be spread through contact. Contact precautions for RSV. Pneumonia is an infection that inflames the air sacs in one or both of the lungs which causes the fluid um, or pus to build up in that lung. Um, this causes irritation and that irritation produces a cough with phlegm or pus, um, fever, chills, and difficulty breathing then develop. This can be caused by bacteria, virus, or fungi. Um, so it just depends on the cause, but the symptoms are gonna be quite similar. So something has caused the inflammation, the fluid to build up, in the 
Um, allergic rhinitis. So this is hay fever. So um, inflammation of the nose related to the immune system's overreaction to allergens in the air. So this is like seasonal allergies, allergic rhinitis. Symptoms are going to be runny or stuffy nose, sneezing, red, itchy, watery eyes, and swelling around the eyes. Um, we're going to treat with antihistamines and symptomatic relief. Um, and of course, avoid exposure if the um, trigger is known. Whooping cough. This is pertussis. So pertussis is uh, the whooping cough. So this is caused by the bacteria Bordetella pertussis. This is a very highly contagious respiratory disease. Um, can be dangerous for infants and silently carried by adults. Um, so an adult that may have a general runny nose, they may just think that they have allergic rhinitis. They have um, seasonal allergy, but this could actually be um, Bordetella pertussis and then carrying it to an infant, to a child, um, who then acquire this virus can be very detrimental, um, can be um, very bad for infants. Um, so that's why education is needed here. So symptoms are going to be runny nose, nasal congestion, sneezing. Um, at first, just like a common cold, then infants is going to progress to this whooping cough and then spasms of the airway. And of course, as those spasms progress or um, increase in severity, increase in um, uh, amount, of course, then you have your complications, you have your hypoxia issues, you have pneumonia, you have brain damage, death can occur from this due to the um, decrease in oxygenation that is occurring. So um, spread. this is going to be spread through airborne respiratory droplets. So this is actually droplet precautions required for these clients. So mask, contact precautions, everything included, and then adding your mask there. So droplet precautions here for whooping cough um, and education to family members is going to be key because it can just seem like a common cold to an adult, but they spread it to infants. So this can actually be prevented um, by adults receiving a Tdap vaccine because that P at the very end is going to include that pertussis. Um, so it's going to pre um, prevent them from acquiring pertussis and transmitting it to newborns. Tuberculosis. This is a disease, infectious disease caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria. Um, it, affects the lungs, but it also affects uh, other parts of the body. This is going to be also spread through airborne droplets, so droplet precautions are going to be required. Um, tuberculosis can be silent or latent, so a client can have tuberculosis and not know it, have no symptoms. Uh, but when symptoms do occur, they um, can include cough that can um, sometimes be blood tinged, not always. Um, weight loss can occur night sweats, fever, um, and then um, of course when these symptoms occur and we note then we're going to um, treat them with multiple different types of antibiotics um, and maybe even an antiviral. We're going to um, prevent the spread. Um, so there are some key things here about um, how to prevent the spread of tuberculosis. Foreign body aspiration. This is very common in uh, pediatric clients. So this can be from peanuts, popcorn, seeds, hot dogs, um, grapes, um, anything that is circular, round, um, getting stuck in their esophagus, in their airway, uh, choking. Um, so it's key for uh, toddlers when giving these types of food to cut them up for them. So hot dogs cut in half so that if they do choke on them, they at least still have half of an airway open. Grapes, cut them in half, um, things like that. Um, or at, And very closely watching them if they do um, give these to their children whole. Um, never leave them alone to uh, eat these or... Uh, somewhere where you can't get to them, like buckled up in the back seat, um, in their car seat. You can't get to that child while they're eating a grape uh, and choking. So being mindful of or uh, food items that can um, become choking hazards. 
And then, of course, the thing that most people think about when they have a child, toddler, um, inorganic items that can be foreign bodies. So pins, nails, screws, bullets, crayons, toy parts, pin tops, um, things like that. The things that are just laying around the house, pennies, dimes, nickels, quarters, all kinds of different things can or just put in their mouth and then accidentally swallowed or aspirated. The concern here is not only um, obstruction of the airway, but also uh, risk for aspiration, pneumonia, and or trauma to the airway, causing that inflammation um, and therefore the inflammatory process building up pus and mucus and infection. So then you have aspiration pneumonia, uh, is due to something being aspirated, of course, so it can come from the mouth uh, due to foreign body that has been aspirated, or it could have come from the stomach and refluxed and then aspirated. So anything that was supposed to go or not supposed to go into the airway is now in the airway. Um, that inflammatory response occurs, uh, builds up, and um, creates the uh, infection in the lungs. Pulmonary edema, um, this can be uh, as a result from pneumonia. Uh, this can be mild to extreme breathing difficulty. Um, cough can be present. Uh, chest pain and fatigue are common. Supplemental oxygen and medications are gonna then be needed to remove that fluid volume. So pulmonary edema being excess of blood, right? Um, excess of um, fluid that is uh, around the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins. And so then what we're gonna do is try and pull that fluid off. So um, treating the cause, um, but we're also gonna need to treat the effect, which is going to be uh, hypoxia. So we're gonna treat with oxygen and we're also gonna treat with removing that fluid by diuretics or any kind of medication to pull that fluid off and controlling blood pressure so that there's less pressure on the lungs at that time. Acute respiratory distress syndrome. This is a type of respiratory failure characterized by the rapid onset of widespread inflammation in the lungs. Um, we're gonna see this as shortness of breath, rapid breathing and bluish discoloration. I mean, it's, it's respiratory failure. So you have this hypoxia state. This can be often very fatal um, to children. Other common terminology that's used in this case for acute respiratory distress syndrome is wet lung or drowning lung. And that's because this is just, this is fluid buildup for whatever reason. It could be sepsis, it could be pneumonia due to injury, um, blunt trauma, blood. Um, something that is wet affecting the lung, which is not allowing the lung to then oxygenate blood. So this wet lung or drowning lung um, is preventing oxygenation of the blood, right? So then we're going to treat with oxygen. We may need to also consider uh, mechanical ventilation. We're going to um, need some fluid management. So what what is the cause of the fluid? If it's um, too much fluid, then of course we may need to restrict fluids if it's due to um, kidneys or whatever that's causing it, um, respiratory illness, uh, fluid management may be indicated, uh, diuretics may be indicated, um, blood pressure medication may be indicated, kind of similarly to the pulmonary hypertension, but this is much more severe and usually occurs quite suddenly. Smoke inhalation injury. This is damage to the airways caused by breathing, um, breathing in of harmful gases, vapors, and particulate matter contained in smoke, of course, from a fire. Um, this is going to be seen as coughing, trouble breathing, uh, scratchy throat, runny nose, irritated the sinuses, wheezing or shortness of breath, or chest pain. So hallmark thing here is going to be a sit in the nose or the throat. Um, that soot being an 
uh, foreign body. You have chemicals in there. It's going to cause inflammatory reaction. This is going to occur very quickly. Um, response to this is quite sudden. So seeing the soot, you're going to need to preserve that airway. So intubating um, to save that airway. So ABCs again here um, to prevent that airway from closing, which could be in any moment as a reaction to the soot. So you see this soot, you need to prepare for intubation again. Okay, smoke, um, tobacco smoke exposure. Um, this is any bystander. So the concern here, of course, is pediatrics, um, children, bystanders breathe in the same dangerous chemicals that the smoker inhales. Studies have been shown that it, the same chemicals that are inhaled by the smoker are exhaled and then inhaled by a bystander. So this can, of course, lead to problems um, for these clients, including frequent and severe asthma attacks. This can be a trigger, smoke, um, respiratory infections, ear infections, um, sudden infant death syndrome, and other things. Um, their risk for these issues increase by being exposed to tobacco smoke. So um, progress in reducing secondhand smoke exposure among U.S. non-smokers has stalled since 2011. 58 million Americans are still exposed to secondhand smoke, including two out of every five children. There is no safe level of secondhand smoke exposure. So education is going to be key. If the parents continue to smoke, they need to be away from their children outside not in another room, outside, away from the child, and um, education to keep the children away even after they're done smoking because it does linger in the air. Asthma. So asthma is the airway narrowing and swelling, uh, which then causes a production of mucus due to the inflammatory response, right? So then this is going to be seen as difficulty breathing um, and then trigger coughing. To occur. Whistling uh, or wheezing is going to be noted, especially on expiration, as this obstruction slowly occurs of the airway. Um, and then can also um, be noted as chest pain in some clients due to the um, decrease in ability to oxygenate. So this can interfere with daily activities and be life threatening. Inhaler use and education is going to be key to these clients and parents of these clients. Um, so then you have the differences of asthma. So mild asthma versus severe asthma uh, is going to be uh, have different symptoms, different um, treatment. So knowing the differences in mild and severe is going to be key. Here, um, mild asthma, we're going to see uh, have less issues. So they may have daytime symptoms twice a week, not every day. Um, minor limitations in activity, um, peak expiratory flow, 80% uh, or greater. So that's great. That's in that green range, remember. Whereas severe asthma is going to have severe um, symptoms, so exaggeration. So we're going to not only have daytime uh, symptoms, but we're also going to have nighttime symptoms twice or more a month. Um, we're going to have symptoms throughout the day, continuously throughout the day, and have severe limitations with activity. Treatment is going to be with inhalers based on the plan, based on the severity, um, so depending on mild versus severe. So it may include in a range of things. They're going to, every asthmatic client is going to have a different plan of care. Um, so Knowing the different types of medications that are options are going to be key and education about those types of uh, medications are going to be key for the nurse caring for these clients. Um, so glucocorticoids may be used. These glucocorticoids are the long term control medications. Um, so this is fluconazone or budesonide. Uh, leukotriene modifiers such as monoclast is used as a preventative or maintenance therapy. And then um, short-acting beta-2 uh, adrenergic 
agonists, such as albuterol, these are your rescue inhalers for sudden or acute asthmatic attacks. So again, knowing the difference of these, um, education is going to be key. You're going to need to know the differences between these um, and recognize the names for these different terminologies of uh, classifications. I mean, education also is going to be to avoid triggers, of course. So any known triggers, any exacerbation that has occurred in the past, such as to um, uh, activity, uh, exercise, things like that. Rinsing their mouth after the use of the steroid medications, glucocorticoids, steroids. Um, so rinsing their mouth to prevent that opportunistic infections. Um, and then checking their PEF twice a day. So they're going to do that peak expiratory flow monitor twice a day, um, hoping to get into that green range every day. Any kind of uh, non-green, yellow, red, uh, if yellow or red occurs, they're going to have uh, on their plan of care, they'll have their little treatment plan of what then should they do next. Um, so it's kind of like an algorithm for them to use at home. Um, also, education is going to be to maintain medication regimen, especially prior to physical activity. So if they plan to uh, go outside, play rigorous um that is fine. Um, just making sure that if the uh, preventing any type of triggers, maybe using a bronchodilator uh, like albuterol before they go outside, that's fine. Um, they're usually not having to be limited from physical activity, um, especially mild or controlled asthma. Uh, usually don't have any restrictions. Um, it's when you get into the severe asthma, the repetitive. Um, asthma attacks, that's when um, we may have to, but in general, most people don't have to be restricted from activities. Okay, cystic fibrosis. This is when the body produces thick and sticky mucus that clogs the lungs and obstructs the pancreas. This is going to be one of those pediatric problems that uh, is going to be uh, common I don't know if it's quite the word, but um, important to know how to recognize, treat, um, and educate about for when uh, cystic fibrosis does occur in these pediatric clients. Um, being uh, anywhere in the pediatric world of nursing, you're going to need to know about cystic fibrosis. And this can be life-threatening in these clients and tend to have a shorter than uh, normal lifespan. So we're going to see symptoms are going to include cough, repeated lung infections because that mucus being stuck in the lungs and inability to gain weight and fatty stools. So it's kind of meh, not really, really anything that is, okay, you have cystic fibrosis you or you just have repeated upper respiratory, lower respiratory infections, right? But the diagnostic key here is going to be hallmarked by positive sweat chloride test. So these clients usually have an increase in sodium and chloride uh, levels in their saliva and in their sweat. So there's other diagnostic things that we can do, of course, like chest x-rays, blood work, things like that to rule out other things. But the hallmark positive diagnosis is going to be noted by a positive sweat chloride test. So that's key. Treatment is then, of course, going to be alleviate that thick mucus from the lungs to prevent blockage of the airways. So we're gonna do this by a bronchodilator followed by chest physiotherapy, CPT. So the bronchodilator, of course, is going to open and dilate the airway um, to open and promote the expulsion of the thick mucus. And then the chest physiotherapy is going to involve percussion of the chest vibration and postural drainage, which is going to be done in the Trendelenburg position. Hold on. And then, uh, which is going to allow the mucus to be removed and expelled from the lungs. So CPT is going to be done um, not near meal times, of course. So we need to do this at least two hours from a meal to prevent aspiration of the food products. It's also going to be done during the client's expirations. So we're going to beat on the chest during the expiratory periods about two hours away from meals to prevent those aspiration risks. Um, 
percussion and vibration of the chest is going to um, promote movement of those uh, of that thick mucus. Dilation is going to uh, promote an easier of that airway from being uh, opened up so that that mucus is no longer stuck and thick. And then of course, hydration fluid um, therapy is going to be key so that it we thin the thick mucus. Um, so those are your three key um, treatments there for cystic fibrosis. Um, education is going to be very key to the um, how to perform chest physiotherapy. Um, they should see this, of course, in the hospital at first when they're first diagnosed by respiratory therapists. But um, education about watch how we do this. You know, this is um, why we do it at this time. This is why we do it this way. Um, so in the Trendelenburg position, gravity helps, right? Um, at, not near meal times, so they're not aspirating. During expiration, not inspiration, so that when they're inhaling and we expel mucus, they're not then re-inhaling the mucus that we're trying to get out. So there's reasons for each portion of this. There's a specific reason for how chest physiotherapy is done. And that's where your education is going to be key to these clients and parents. Obstructive sleep disordered breathing. This is breathing that repeatedly stops and starts related to or during sleeping. Obstruction uh, can be due to inflammation of the tissue or tongue or any other obstacle that obstructs the airway during this sleeping process. So relief of the obstacle is going to be one of the treatment options or treatment with forced air. So to keep the airway open. So this can be done through use of the CPAP. Forcing that airway keeps that um, blocked airway forced in the open position. All right. Respiratory failure. This occurs when this lung cannot get enough oxygen into the blood. This causes CO2 to build up um, and causes damage to the tissues and organs that are being then delivered this uh, hypoxic uh, CO2 ridden blood, right? So further uh, impairing oxygenation of the blood and slows oxygen delivery to the tissue. So then, of course, your signs and symptoms are going to be of hypoxia, of uh, respiratory distress. So you have tachypnea, uh, your respiratory rate that's different in your different age groups here, your dyspnea, retractions, grunting, nasal flaring, apnea, altered mental status due to your hypoxic state, and then of course pulse oximetry measurement is going to be less than 90% on room air. Um, so you have your different um, causes here. It could be due to a decrease in the pump or an increase in the load, uh, but one is going to eventually cause the other, so both are going to be present as a result from the hypercapnia, the increase in CO2.